Hi friends and welcome back. Today we are going to have a little bit of a catch up about reading lists. I am going to share with you an update on a couple of reading lists I've had on the go for, one of them has been on the go for about a year, the other one just for a couple of months, and I'm going to share with you some books that I have earmarked, bookmarked for non-fiction November. I've got about six books that I would like to reach for first, ones that are at the top of my list. Firstly, I want to thank you for your responses and your reaction to my last few videos. I feel like I found my groove again after being in a reading slump for a couple of months and it's been great to hear that you have been loving those videos as well. It's been a lot of fun trying to think of different topics to come up with and I have to say there is nothing better than just reading the books and talking about the books with you. So it was a little bit of a challenge when I was in a slump trying to think of things to come up with when I wasn't reading quite so much so I'm glad that it resonated with you still. November is turning out to be a good month already. I have read James. I read it in a couple of days over the weekend and it was incredible. I cannot wait to share my thoughts with you. Um, I am currently reading Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. I'm about halfway through this book and I'm enjoying it. It is totally out of my comfort zone. It is dystopian, it is science fiction, it is my first Ishiguro, it is, but it is something that was on my spring TBR, which we'll get to in a little bit. And I, I'm in, I am enjoying it. It is quite, quite gripping, even though it is a very, very subtle and slow read, I am enjoying it. So that is what I currently have on the go at the moment. So let's chat a little bit about reading lists. Early, Early on when I started my YouTube channel, I shared a video about children's books. I shared about why we should read children's books, why I wanted to read children's books, and a little bit of a project of some books that I wanted to get to. And these are classic children's books. I really am not reading a lot of modern contemporary children's books. So these are your Anne of Green Gables and Little Women and Peter Pan and Charlotte's Web, those kind of books. So I will provide a link down below to this original video if you would like to go see it. I really did enjoy that process of coming up with an initial reading list of books that I wanted to get to that I never read initially in childhood. I didn't read a lot of children's classics. And I think I did read the abridged versions or the fairy tale version, but perhaps not the uncut, unabridged version of the book. And it was something I wanted to do. I wanted to achieve that, especially when I was watching a lot of YouTubers talking about how you know, they grew up reading Little Women when they were 11 years old, and that was not something I did. And it was actually a question I asked my mum a little while ago. I said, why didn't you give me these books? Why didn't you give me Pride and Prejudice to read when I was a teenager or Little Women or, you know, these kind of things? And she was just like, I didn't think you'd want to read it because it was just so remote from what we were living, you know, and I kind of understand that. And it was probably true. I probably wouldn't have gotten into it. I loved the movies. I did love the story. So maybe I would have read it. I don't know. It's who knows, who knows, but I'm reading them now. I am reading them now and I am enjoying them now. I'm finding a lot of warmth and familiarity in these stories already. So when I shared the video with you, I had already started reading a number of books in this project. I had already read some books like The Secret Garden, A Little Princess, things like that. So I had already read a number of books and I was adding a few more onto them. And so to date, what I've done is I have read I think in that video I shared seven more books that I wanted to get to this year and so far I've knocked off five of those and the most recent one was Heidi that I had read. So I still have two more books on that list that I want to get to and that is Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland and I'm really happy with that. I'm really, really happy with that. So I've kind of read a book every couple of months but I've picked up extras I didn't expect to read as many Winnie the Pooh books as I did. There were some other ones that I didn't expect to pick up that were definitely focused towards children. Um, and that's the, this is why I kind of wanted to talk about this, is that the reading list has grown. And so what my initial reading list started as has continued to grow over this year. For example, now I've added The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Huckleberry Finn has been added to it. How's Moving Castle, Black Beauty. A Wrinkle in Time is another one that I've added to it. And these are all books that I have not read. I have read Black Beauty. I have read Black Beauty, but I have not read those other ones. 
And because I've got all these other ones I wanted to add to it, I think I'm just going to let the reading list go and just continue to read children's books as part of my everyday reading repertoire. You know, it's just going to be another genre. A classic children's books is going to be another genre that I regularly include in my reading. There is one particular Australian one that I'm trying to get hold of, which is, I didn't realize it was um, an actual book book. I thought it was... I, as a child, I read the abridged version for sure, and that is The Magic Pudding, and it is a classic Australian children's book that I am excited to get to. I will most definitely buy the, the book and the abridged version for my grandkids. So that's definitely one I want to get, and so I might buy that for Christmas because The Magic Pudding, I think, is the Christmas pudding. So anyway, so this is, it just continues to snowball. So my classic children's book reading project is finished and I'm so happy with what I've achieved with it. However, my spring TBR reading list has been a little bit of a fizzer. When I shared that video with you, which again, I'll link below, I am such a mood reader and I think I knew I was gonna be shooting myself in the foot with this because even though I was setting this little bit of a goal of these were some books that I felt were gonna be really spring inspired and I really wanted to get to for a number of reasons Reasons, I went into a reading slump in September as soon as spring started I went into a slump and then the slump continued in October and here we are in November at the end of spring and I have only read two books of the eight books that I really wanted to get to and I had a, a much bigger collection of books on the TBR but there was eight books that I was like these are the ones that are really going to hit the goals that I want to achieve. You know, there was a children's classic, there was, and that was Heidi, so I did achieve that one. There was also an Australian book, a big book, so something over 500 pages, a classic. I forget what the other ones were, but there was about, there was eight different categories that I really wanted to tick off, so every book had a different one. And then I had a number of other books that were just spring-ish inspired that I thought would be kind of fun to reach for first. But a combination of mood reading and slump really didn't help. And so I've only read two of the eight. Oh, non-fiction. H is for Hawk was the other one. Heidi and H is for Hawk were the two that I've read. So what I've what I think I'm gonna do this month is I'm just gonna be gentle with myself. Clara Clara and the Sun is actually on my spring TBR. So this will be a third one knock you know coming off that list. I'm just going to be gentle with myself on this and I'm just going to see what else I can read off this list. But there's a few books in nonfiction November that I would love to get to for some reasons I'll share with you soon. So I'm going to be gentle with myself. I am not feeling guilty that I have not gotten to my TBR and I would encourage you that if you ever set a TBR or a reading list and you don't get to it, don't feel guilty. These are just guides. These are just, you know, some goals for sure. But I'm doing this for fun. I am doing this channel for fun. I am reading for fun. And at the end of the day, if I have picked up another book, if I picked up James, which is not on my spring TBR because I was planning on reading it later in summer, and I had a whale of a time reading that, and I loved that book, I'm okay with that. That is absolutely okay by me. I'm not going to feel guilty that I didn't pick up East of Eden or The Light Years or Peter Carey's The True History of the Kelly Gang. I do not feel guilty about that at all. I'm going to be gentle with myself. I'm going to finish this one, which will be the third book on my spring TBR. And I'll have a look and see if something else jumps out at me after that. If I can read one more book off my spring TBR, that will bring me up to a 50% completion, which is Heck, that is pretty good. That was probably a lot better than I would have thought that I would have achieved. For someone that doesn't like being told what to do, that is a pretty that would be a pretty good outcome. But it has taught me some lessons around reading lists. I don't know, I'll have to have a think about how I want to do it in the future, whether I do want to do a TBR in the future, whether I want to be a little bit more succinct about it, be very, very specific about it. The problem is there's just so many books out there that I want to get to and I want to share them all with you guys. <laughs> it's really hard to, to keep that list very small. There was so many more that I could have shared with you on that spring TBR. I'll have to have a think about it, see if I want to do something for summer, maybe share another eight books that are at the top of my list that I would like to get to over the summer or just just go with the flow and I don't know. I'll have to have a think about it, see how I want to approach that. But anyway, let's get into some books that I would like to 
read for nonfiction November because I am feeling nonfiction vibes right now. My understanding of this challenge is it was a challenge set by a book olive, gosh, about 10 years ago, nine years ago. And the only premise for this challenge is that you need to read a nonfiction book in nonfiction November. Um, the goal would be, I guess, if you are a nonfiction reader normally, just try and increase the number of nonfiction books that you read. And it's just about encouraging people to read more nonfiction. You know, f novels and fiction is not the only, not, they're not the only books out there. Nonfiction can be incredibly rewarding and so rich. And so, I mean, there are such incredible stories as well as teachings and learning that you can get out of them. So I, I am all for it. So I had a look back over how many books, how many non-fiction books I have actually read so far this year, and about a quarter of the books that I have read have been non-fiction, so 25%. And I've read 52 books, so that's not bad. I don't try and hit a target of non-fiction books, but it's probably about right. I would, I always want to read more non-fiction. I feel like, I personally believe that you should be learning something new every single day, and Nonfiction books are a great way for that to happen. So, if I can read a little more nonfiction, I would love that to happen. So, I would like to increase it a little more. But they can be a little challenging. They sometimes can be a little bit dry if they don't have a an engaging narrative, especially if there's something that is very, very you know theory based. Like if it is something medical or health based, it can be a little bit dry. Even business or that kind of stuff. So it can. So for that reason, I don't reach for them all the time, and I often lean towards audiobooks for a lot of nonfiction. In October, I read one nonfiction book. In September, I didn't read any nonfiction books. So I am overdue to get my nonfiction fix. And in November, I would like to read two nonfiction books. But going against what exactly what I just said, I'm going to share with you six nonfiction books that are kind of on the list that I would like to cherry pick from. I've also tried to stay away from any nonfiction books that are currently on my spring TBR because if I get one of those ones, great. If I don't, whatever. But I don't want to kind of be rinsing and repeating those books. I really want to get gritty and get books that are going to be nurturing and teach me something new and, and uh, help me experience something different and t give me different perspectives. I really want to have that happen. These are the ones that I have chosen. The first one is not actually one that's with me. It is a book that I shared with you briefly recently and I've been listening to it on audio. I haven't listened to it for a little bit because the, the, the physical book is due to arrive here today. And it is called A well Garden Mind by Sue Stewart-Smith. I don't know how I came across it, actually, but I did see a comparison between um, saying that if you liked Alice Vincent's Why Women Grow, you will like The well Garden Mind. And The well Garden Mind is about the connection between gardening and mental health. And so far, I am loving it. It is really, really interesting. I believe that Sue Stewart-Smith is, she is a psychologist. And she she talks about how gardening, being in nature, being around plants is a holistic way to, re, to, to be rejuvenated, to be repaired, to be made whole. And she talks about a journey that a number of people are going through. I'm, I'm in reading the in listening to the book, I'm about a quarter of the way through, I think. And it is a beautiful listen as well. She narrates it and her voice is so gentle and so nurturing. But some of the statistics are just fascinating. You know, she she has one of the statistics, and I think this might be based in the UK, is that prisoners see they are exposed to more outdoor time than some children. That children are indoors so much doing indoors things that the prisoners that get one hour of outdoor time are exposed to more sunlight than children. And I I found that incredibly eye opening. And that is something that I struggle with at times is that I get caught up in the environment at home, whether it's doing chores or working or reading or whatever it might be, that I forget to get out and do things outside in the sun. And I have a garden and I love to garden and I have a garden that is fairly self-sufficient, but I do have a vegetable garden, but I could be so much better at it. And I do know that it is so healing to be in it and that was something I got from the Alice Vincent book Why Women Grow that there is something about putting your hands in the dirt and leaving everything there 
And there was a, I recently watched the Martha documentary and it was opened up with this quote uh, from Martha where she was saying, uh, if you want to be happy for a year, get married. If you want to be happy for something, around, if you want to be happy for a lifetime, grow a garden. And I fully believe that. And I am feeling more and more drawn to gardening lately and I want to be more in it. And I feel I feel I am aware of those benefits for my own mental health being in the garden. It, it's very interesting. So I'm enjoying reading it. I would love to finish that book this month and that will definitely be part of that. Um, I'm definitely being drawn towards books that are focused focusing on mental health. If you look at what people are reading for nonfiction, I think it is a real glimpse into what they're going through personally. So this is probably a quite, you know, opening up a little bit of a journal, but I am most definitely being drawn towards mental health and awareness at the moment and how I can improve my own mental health, maybe help the people around me that might be struggling with some mental health issues, whether they are aware of it or not, just be more cognizant of it. So something else that I also wanted to read this month was um, Breath by James Nestor. And while this isn't specifically mental health itself, it is definitely health and I think there is an element of that mental awareness of it. So this particular book is about how we have, everyone can breathe, everyone breathes every single minute of every single day, but quite often we are not doing it correctly and that is causing problems in many areas of our lives. This book is taking us through a number of different processes and information sources to help us get to a better place of breathing. And I'm looking forward to experiencing some techniques in here to help with maybe some you know, some breathing techniques, you know, to help with stress, stress relief and that kind of stuff. So the synopsis says, there is nothing more essential to our health and well-being than breathing. Take air in, let it out, repeat 25,000 times a day. Yet as a species, humans have lost the ability to breathe correctly with grave consequences. In breath, journalist James Nestor travels the world to discover the hidden science behind ancient breathing practices, discovering that if we make even slight adjustments to the way we inhale and exhale, we can jumpstart athletic performance, rejuvenate internal organs, halt snoring, allergies, asthma and autoimmune disease, straighten scoliotic spines. Breath turns conventional wisdom of what we thought we knew about our most basic biological function on its head. It's definitely something that I would love to know a little bit more about. I want to learn some more tools for my own stress reducing in my life and breath work is one of them. So that is something that I would love to be able to read this month and it was only published in 2020 so it's not been around for too long but it's most definitely getting a lot of traction and I think it will be really interesting to read. So another book that has a element of mental health awareness is uh, All Before Me from Esther Rutter. And this is a memoir. It also has some literary aspects in there. My understanding of this book is that es Esther Rutter suffered a mental breakdown while she was living in Japan. And I don't know how, but somehow she ended up in the Lake District in the UK and she, I think she was working at Dove Cottage, which was the Wordsworth's Cottage. And she ended up recovering and she found her sense of place and belonging and community and she recovers from this awful experience that she had. And so I, th I think it's going to be really tender and thoughtful and I, so I think there's going to be some two, two parallel stories of the Wordsworths and Esther's story. And I'm really, I really, really want to read this. I think it's going to be quite beautiful. It's another story a little bit about mental health and about perhaps about finding where you fit in after going through something like that. I think it would be a really lovely book. So that is another one that I would love to read this month. And then another one on the little bit of a, a literary vein is Ex Libris from Anne Fadiman. And I think it's important that you have some low hanging fruit on a reading list. It's important to have something that is small and achievable. So perhaps if you're not ready to get into a 400 page book, you can easily pick up something much smaller. And this is small. This is 162 pages and it's a selection of essays. So Ex Libris is um, yeah, it's Confessions of a Common Reader. It is about books. It is about Anne's relationship with books. Anne Fadiman is, by her own admission, the sort of person who learned about sex from her father's copy of Fanny Hill. 
who, whose husband buys her 19 pounds of dusty books for her birthday and who once found herself poring over a 1974 Toyota Corolla manual because it was the only written material in her apartment that she had not read at least twice. Ex Libris recounts a lifelong love affair with books and language. For Fadiman, as for many passionate readers, the books she loves have become chapters in her own life story. I think that's something I'm looking forward to. You know when you read a book and it becomes that, it is that moment, it is that book end in that chapter where you remember that you read that at that particular time, like a song, and you hear the song and you remember that moment in your life. And so those are the sort of things that I think I'm going to get out of this. And it's something perhaps that I could read, you know, at night. I have started reading it a little bit, but that is something I think would be ideal. And then I do have something that is a little bit different, which maybe a lot of American viewers will not be aware of. And that is a memoir, or not a memoir, it's a biography of Banjo Patterson by Grantley Kezia. Now, Banjo Patterson is one of Australia's most famous poets. I could most definitely recite at least two to three of his poems off the top of my head, and I am not a huge poetry buff. I have not read anything of his for years. It's something we would have learnt in school or sung in school. These are things that I wanted to learn this year. I wanted to learn more about Australia, more about Australians, whether they are colonial Australians or they are First Nation Australians. I want to learn more. And Banjo Patterson is most definitely one of Australia's most uh, most well-known storytellers. So Grantley Kezia is prolific in his writings and he writes stories about Australians. It's probably up there with, um, I think it's, is it Ron Cherov? He wrote Alexander Hamilton and I think he wrote George Washington and so he writes about these political figures. Grantley Kezia does similar but with Australian figures, not necessarily political. All these different people that have added in some way to Australia's history. A banjo is a banjo Patterson is one of our most most famous storytellers, and I would love to read this. A.B. Banjo Patterson is recognised as Australia's greatest storyteller and most celebrated poet, the boy from the bush who became the voice of a generation. He gave us our unofficial national anthem, Waltzing Matilda, and treasured ballads such as The Man from Snowy River and Clancy of the Overflow, vivid creations that helped to define our national identity. Born in the bush as a child, Banjo rode his pony to a one-room school along a trail frequented by frequented by outlaw Ben Hall. As a young man, he befriended Breaker Morant and covered the Second Boer War as a reporter, later fudging his age to enlist during World War I. The tennis ace, notorious ladies' man, brilliant jockey, newspaper editor and columnist, foreign correspondent and ABC broadcaster, knew many luminaries of his time and was an eyewitness to countless moments in Australian history. I think it just sounds like such an incredible life and his, like I said, his writing is something that I know and I, I know it off by heart already. So I would love to be able to start reading this to, to understand a little bit more about who Banjo Patterson was, how he came up with these stories. You, you may know some of those as well, Waltzing Matilda most definitely. That's definitely something I would love to read. And then again, for a little bit of low hanging fruit, I have two because I'm not sure which one I would like to read. But these are two books about Winnie the Pooh and the knowledge and wisdom that Winnie the Pooh can bring us. So the first, so these are two options. The first one is The Tao of Pooh by Benjamin Hoff. And this is just simply about getting the wisdom from Winnie the Pooh. And so that what it says is, Winnie the Pooh has a certain way about him, a way of doing things which has made him the world's most beloved bear, and Pooh's way, as Benjamin Hoff brilliantly demonstrates, seems strangely close to the ancient Chinese principles of Taoism. When Aeor frets and Piglet hesitates and Owl pontificates, Pooh just is. So I thought that could be really interesting, especially to kind of understand that peacefulness that Pooh has. So that's one option. The other option is A Walk in the Wood, Meditations on Mindfulness with a Bear Named Pooh by Dr. Joseph Parent and Nancy Parent. And it's a little bit similar. So the summary is A Walk in the Wood, Meditations on Mindfulness with a Bear Named Pooh offers life lessons grounded in the simple act of slowing down observing what is around us and being present in our lives moment by moment. The benefits of mindfulness are well recognized. Greater peace of mind, less stress, and the opportunity to work through and transform thoughts, memories, and worries. 
In our frantic world, who better to guide readers through this transformative practice than a long beloved bear who has just perfected the art of simply being? Just two things to do to truly be poo. Just be present and kind, he says. A Walk in the Woods is both inspiring and instructive, simple stories with clearly stated goals and easy to follow exercises provide all the tools you need to take the first step or continue your journey towards a quieter and calmer way of living. Beautifully laid out book. I think there is a lot of, again, extracts of stories in here of, of you know, from the, from the books and then just some surrounding bits around it about how, what you can take out of it. I think this might be the one that I want to read. It's just been sitting on my bedside table for a while and I've never quite gotten to it, but I think that probably fits into my thirst for mental health anything right now. Just a little bit of just the tools, tools that you can have ready to calm your mind, to find some peace, to breathe a little deeper. I think that would be lovely. So a walk in the wood with poo. To be honest, just reading a little bit of Winnie the Pooh this month could be a nice thing. I do have a book ready to go. Maybe that'll be happening. So those are some of the books that I have on my nonfiction November. I am I'm just going to try and read two of these. I don't want to read them all, so we'll see how we go with that. We'll I'll check in with you at the end, at the start of December, and we'll see how that all went. But I hope, let me know if you are participating in Nonfiction November and maybe how many books you have on the go. Are you just doing the prompts or do you have like a longer list? Are you going to do just nonfiction this month or are you going to mix it up with a bit of fiction and nonfiction? I'm really excited for it. There's nothing like a little bit of a challenge, I think. So thank you so much for joining me. Like I said, I'll leave some links below to those videos I mentioned at the start to my spring TBR video and my children's classics books children's classics books video and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye!